Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We have an awesome show for you this week. A lot of stuff to get to. So I'm going to bring in news editor Joel Stocksdale, who is fresh back from the island, uh, one of the islands in Hawaii. Where were you? I'm on the big island. Uh, the big island. Okay. Started out in Kona and then uh, took a couple days and went to the other side of the island. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. I haven't been there in 10 years. I would love to get back. Uh, and you were there to drive the Toyota Grand Highlander, which we can't talk about as far as drive impressions. Uh, that'll be a future podcast. But by the time you listen to this, actually, it'll still be a few days out from the embargo. So come back next week. We'll have the full story. Uh, but you may have noticed there is a new Toyota Tacoma. That was one of the things Joel saw. It was pretty cool. There's a lot to unpack there. We'll run through some other news items. There's the electric Escalade. Uh, Mercedes SL43, news out of BMW. Honda is back at F1. That's kind of cool. We'll talk about some sports cars, specifically the Corvette and maybe the Hyundai Envision 74. It's off and on again. We'll see. Lots of rumors flying there. I've been driving the Kia Telluride SX Prestige X Pro, and Joel spent some time in a slingshot. So that's pretty cool. We've got some money to spend. So let's get right into it. The Tacoma. Um, What's I think the most significant part of this is it actually is a really new Tacoma. This isn't like the typical Toyota playbook where it's the same, it's the same truck, it's the same frame. It's like this is a legitimately new generation. Yeah, it's built off the same platform as the Tundra and the Land Cruiser and the Sequoia. And yeah, it's it's very new. It's got uh four cylinder engines across the board. One of them is a hybrid. There are no more V6s. Uh, it's got loads and loads of trims. There's definitely still some old school stuff though. Um, you'll still be able to get a manual transmission. The base models still have leaf spring suspension, whereas higher trim ones get a uh, coil spring rear end. There are new off-road models. There's, there's a, yeah, there's a whole lot. To, there's a lot to, cover with it uh any any particular areas you want to talk about first yeah no it's it's really interesting i think um what do you think of the design that's always like just first looks it definitely to me is more of a tundra vibe uh which i kind of like the older almost dated look it was a very signature appearance but i mean you saw it what do you what do you think start there yeah it definitely looks like small tundra but i think it I think it takes the Tundra's design idea and improves on it because it, it okay. does add a good dose of Tacoma-ness. It's got a slightly more modest kind of main grill. Uh, the whole thing looks just a little bit smaller and more lithe and not, and not just in the sense that it is a smaller truck. It just, it, it doesn't look quite as massive as the bigger trucks. And I think that works pretty well. And to be honest, I think, I think there's more classic Tacoma look in there than maybe it looks like in, per in photos, uh, in person, it still comes across very much as kind of very similar size and feel. Now the couple things here, there's the trail hunter, which is kind of a cool trim. And there's also the hybrid. Maybe let's start with like the Trail Hunter version because that's maybe a little funner than the hybrid, but the hybrid's very important. So Trail Hunter, what's that? Uh, well, the Trail Hunter is a hybrid. Uh, the okay. hybrid engine is available uh, across the range. Um, you've got two, there's basically two versions of a 2.4 liter turbocharged four cylinder. One that's not hybrid and one that is hybrid. Although that's not entirely accurate either because the non-hybrid version has a couple of variants. There's a low output version for the base SR, which is, it's detuned slightly so that Toyota can get away with a little bit less cooling and a little bit less on the uh, kind of noise and vibration harshness mounts and things. Um, since with that lower peak output, it doesn't quite need as heavy duty equipment. <laughs> And the manual makes ever so slightly less power and torque than the automatic version of that turbo four cylinder. And then the, there's the hybrid version and that makes a very impressive 326 horsepower and 465 pound feet of torque. 
that engine comes in the Trail Hunter as well as the TRD Pro. And besides all that uh, horsepower, there's also like actual electrical power that's kind of nice. It adds a 2.4 kilowatts worth of onboard power to power tools or camping equipment, appliances, things like that. Um, as for the Trail Hunter, that's the newest off-road variant, and it's designed to be kind of the overlanding, sort of slow and steady off-roader, kind of to combat like the uh, Chevy, Sil Chevy Colorado ZR2 Bison uh, with that has American Expedition Vehicle stuff on it. The Trail Hunter has parts from ARB and Old Man Emu, uh, Australian brands that have been doing off-roading stuff for, for decades. And the Trail Hunter 8 gets uh, special shocks from Old Man Emu. It gets 33-inch tires. It's got a air compressor in the back for camping equipment, for, re for airing up your tires. Uh, you can get it with a with a snorkel for the intake and roof racks and things like that. So that's a quick overview of the engines and the trail hunter. Yeah. You know what I think is interesting is the fact that they're going to try and go with a hybrid here. You know, Toyota has stuck with, stuck with hybrids. Uh, obviously that's exhibited not just by like some of these in between models, but like, you know, the Prius. But I mean, if you're, like, let's say you're kind of more agnostic in this segment. You're just trying to figure out which one works for me. I mean, the hybrid is a pretty compelling argument, I think, for a lot of people. We don't know fuel economy yet. And, you know, I, I really will be interested to see where that falls. But I think that could be a key differentiator. Yeah, I, I really hope that the hybrid gets fairly impressive fuel economy. I'm not... I'm not holding my breath all that much, though. I think it'll be good and probably compared with, like, equivalent engines from other automakers, like, in particular, the um, high-output turbo engines from Ford. I could see it being more efficient in that sense, but I would not be expecting anything, like, kind of Prius-like, because... Yeah. I mean, the numbers are the numbers for power and torque that we just covered are quite high. And so I am expecting this hybrid to be much more like what is in the Tundra and the Sequoia, in which the focus is more on outright performance and power as opposed to efficiency. So, which. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with that. And, like, Toyota's sort of more output-oriented hybrids are nice. Um, but I'll also be slightly disappointed if we're not getting something maybe almost, almost akin to, like, a Maverick hybrid, but in a slightly larger, more truck-like form factor. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're looking for a hybrid truck, your options are you know, a little bit limited. Uh, same with the manual transmission. It's this or the Gladiator. And I've never been a huge fan of uh, Jeep's manual transmissions, specifically in the Wrangler or the Gladiator. So, I mean, you know, Toyota, I think the floor is yours if you can, you know, offer something that's, you know, a little less notchy, but still kind of trucky. I mean, that's kind of cool, I think. Um, they really are sticking with, you know, some of the really hardcore Tacoma buyers here. So, uh, you know, I imagine, I imagine that'll be pretty good. Would you take a manual transmission or is that you wouldn't bother with that in the Tacoma? Well, on the outgoing one, the manual is far and away the one that I would recommend because okay. I don't think that the six speed automatic in the current, in the current Tacoma is very good. As for this generation, the automatic will probably be a good one to go with because it's going to an eight speed automatic. And Toyota's multi-speed transmission, multi-speed automatics have been honestly pretty good. That being said, I really like the idea of that base turbo engine with a manual transmission. 
because I'm sure that it's going to be easy to squeeze out more power with uh, an aftermarket tune and things. And like, I honestly would kind of like to see if Toyota doesn't do it to see the aftermarket kind of offering stuff that lets you turn like a two wheel drive manual transmission Tacoma into sort of a little sports truck, turn up the boost, lower it and have like a fairly, a fairly quick and fairly and somewhat affordable uh, vehicle that is also super practical. Um, basically I'm thinking like a lowered TRD sport. Okay. What, um, you know, what else you saw it, you know, uh, you were there. What other takeaways here do you have? So we should definitely talk about TRD pro, okay. which has a lot, of, which shares a lot of things with the trail hunter, but gets some additional special parts. It gets, manually adjustable Fox racing shocks. And it also gets 33 inch tires and a little bit of suspension lift. But one of the show pieces is inside where it has these, they call them isodynamic seats. And they're, they're, they're seats that are outfitted with shock absorbers and they're, they're pressurized with air there's a couple of vertical shocks and a couple of horizontal shocks and then some ball joints that let the seat kind of move a little bit. And it's all there so that when you're off-roading like high speed type stuff, kind of like if you're trying to keep up with your buddy's F-150 Raptor or something, those seats will also help absorb some of the bouncing and shocks but, uh, other than your truck suspension. And the idea is that it will help keep you from getting overly tired and it'll also kind of help you maintain your visibility and kind of be more confident and quicker off-road as a result. And, and besides cool. the potential physical uh, helping, they also look really cool because you can see all, you can see the shock absorbers and the frame and stuff in it uh, from the back. So it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah, that is, that is neat. I mean, you, I don't know who else would do that. Who else does that in production vehicles? Off the top of my head, I would struggle to name one. Do, do you happen to know? It's, it's definitely a, um, an interesting play. Yeah, I mean, usually I've seen like suspended seats as more of a feature for like commercial trucks and things that may have yeah. otherwise very rough suspension. And so that's done so that without having to invest too much in making the rest of the truck comfortable, they can make the seat comfortable. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting. But as for like okay. uh consumer grade stuff, this is very unique. It's cool. It's cool. I think my kind of general takeaway here is that they did Enough to make it new, obviously new, but they also brought enough to it to make it different, advance it, you know, move the ball down the field, like from the seats to the new trims to the hybrid to maintaining, you know, a manual transmission offering, uh, the style. I mean, it's very significant. And I, I think Toyota is perhaps the one branded the segment that could have gotten away with doing, well, we'll keep the platform, we'll change the styling a little bit. We'll do some different things because they have so much built up loyalty and goodwill. But by doing what they did, I think they can like, you know, definitely do some conquests. You know, this is one of those things where like the segment is very strong right now. But if you're not like in the top three or four, you know, you're, you know, if you're not, you know, you know, you're on the menu at that point, you know, you're not really... You know, you could be what's for dinner and Toyota has decided they want to be, you know, the, you know, the hunter rather than the prey. And I think that's cool. I think that's reflected in this truck. I can't wait to drive it. So, yeah, I think, I think Toyota finally realized that the competition, particularly from like GM and Ford have gotten mm -hmm. very serious mm -hmm. and Toyota can't, and I think Toyota finally figured out that they can't just keep sitting around on the same old Tacoma forever. 
which is kind of what they've done. And it's been working because they have so much momentum in the segment, but they, I mean, for, for years, I think all of us on the Autoblog team have been like, I don't know why you would buy a current Tacoma because it's not mm-hmm. all that great. Yep. Except for reval, except for like resale value and reliability. But I think Toyota finally figured out that they, they need to get serious. And I think they really did the, mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that's also impressive that we didn't quite get to was the amount of choice you have with this new yeah. Tacoma. You can get two different cabs. You can get an extended cab or a quad cab. You've got two bed choices. You've got the uh, five foot bed on the cu- on the uh, quad cab that comes standard, or you can get it with a six foot bed, and that six foot bed is standard on the extended cab. And you've got manual. You've got automatic. You've got non hybrid. You've got hybrid. You've got oodles of trim levels. You've got um coil spring and leaf spring suspension option, like the amount of selection is almost rivaling some full size trucks. And, the, and it's also, and it's interesting to see this in the midsize truck segment where things are kind of consolidating to the crew cab short bed body style. That's all that Ford is offering on the Ranger. That's all the GM is going to offer on the Colorado and Canyon for this generation. So it, it's impressive to see that level of selection and to see modern powertrains, modernized interior, really serious off-road variants. To- Toyota Toyota got serious with Tacoma, and I think I think everybody wins with it. Well said. Leave, let's leave it there. Uh, check out uh, obviously check out the site. We have a ton of uh, content related to this. Joel did some walk-arounds of the truck itself if you want to kind of sort of put yourself on the big island there in Hawaii. Uh, full coverage. Uh, so, you know, check it out. Drop us a line. That's podcast at autoblog.com. If you have any initial reactions, maybe we'll read some of them on the air if you, uh, you know, you want to, you know, get in there. And, of course, let us know what you think in the comments. All right. There's going to be a four-cylinder SL. That's kind of weird in some ways. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense too. Uh, this is the Mercedes SL 43 that, uh, you know, Mercedes actually has brought this up, uh, geez, over a year ago, globally unclear if, Hey, this is actually going to be a thing in the United States. And they have now said it will be, I, I think this could be very, uh, okay play for them. I, I guess I don't have a hot take on it. I think it, it doesn't hurt anything. I don't think it's going to really change much. What do you think? Well, I like the idea of it because I could see it being sort of a cool alternative to like a BMW Z4 mm. or maybe even like mm. Porsche Boxster. But then I was looking at the numbers and the pricing and I I don't think this is a great idea, to be honest. It's, so it's a good it's a good value compared to the other SLs, but not uh, compared to the cars you just named. Is it a good value next to the others? I mean, I, like I'm looking at the price. The SL43 starts at hundred and eleven thousand dollars. It's a lot for a four banger, and the next one. The SL55, you know, it's it's a it's a big jump. It's another twenty seven thousand dollars, but that twenty seven thousand dollars doubles your doubles your uh, cylinder count. You get a V eight out of it, um, which I mean, aside from like performance improvements, the that just it just sounds and kind of feels like a more impressive thing. Um and if I'm spending six figures on a car, I don't know, I feel like I'd have a hard time except I mean I like four cylinders. They're really great four cylinders. 
I don't think 375 horsepower for for a hundred thousand plus dollars is is a good value. I mean, like, like I said, force like I was ho- I was expecting something kind of like Boxster Z4 Supra competitor, and and the, the power is actually very close to those, but the price just isn't. I. I think this is I, I think this is kind of a bad deal. Bad deal. Okay, you heard it here first. Don't waste your money. Don't spend your money on the SL forty three. Uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I think my argument is that in all elements of you know the automotive industry, if you will, having different things is good. You know, but as you know, as I sort of look at it, I do kind of wonder who would be the customer for this. Because if you have the money for the SL, I don't think that extra is at twenty-seven grand, as we wrote in our story. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Like you have one hundred and eleven grand for a car, you probably have one hundred and thirty-eight, one hundred and thirty-nine. You know, and given the fact that a lot of people are probably using these things to pull up to very nice golf clubs and things, you do start to lose some of the pizzazz with the four-cylinder. Now, I will argue, on the other hand, just the merits of the car, 375 horsepower is pretty good. You know, I mean, if they had called it some inline six that was designed and built by, you know, the descendants of Gottlieb, you know, Daimler, and it has some design that harks back, you know, I think maybe you could have, like, you would just say 375, that sounds pretty good. I think a inline six, that could work too. I do think that's where like the the inline four, you run into a, like, there's some cognitive dissonance there. Yeah. And, and you make a good point. Like if it was six cylinders, I, I might not be bulking quite as much. And, and honestly, the thought was crossing my mind. Mercedes has a really, really sweet straight six that they offer in some of their cars. And I'm a li- I'm a little surprised and confused why that's not being offered instead. Granted, the performance isn't really a huge amount more than the four cylinder, depending on like state of tune, but it is a very, very sweet engine. It sounds so good and it's so smooth. Um, but I think even that, I just, man, $111,000 is a lot for just 375 horsepower. Yeah. I mean, this is this is this is a lot more than even like a base Corvette and that's getting you 500 horsepower and a big meaty V8 and supercar vibes cuz it's a mid-engine thing. Um like what what does like what does even a Porsche 911 start at right now? Because this is this point. is getting into that territory, I think. Yeah, and I mean, which would you rather drive? I mean, I think we both know the answers. I do like the SL a lot for what it is, but it's it's yeah. I mean, in some ways, it does have kind of like a luxurious retirement car feel, you know? Like it's yeah. I mean, it's it's not super crazy sporty, other than yeah, the power numbers are great and it looks great, but as far as like. Having that dialed in connected feel, I mean, yeah. Okay, so a base 911 starts at around $115,000 and it's 379 horsepower. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess it's comparable to a 911 and that is kind of the area that it's playing in, but man, I just, it still just feels like a lot. And granted, I know that the new SL has gone a long way in returning to its sports car roots as opposed to its kind of boulevard cruiser type convertible feel. I don't know. I just, maybe, maybe I'm too value conscious to be kind of a Mercedes buyer. I don't know. I, it just feels like a lot and especially when like, when you're kind of getting to this price point, making that leap to the V8 doesn't feel like that huge of a jump. 
Yeah, ball game. I agree with you. That's where it's kind of like you're going to spend the 111. Why not just go to 138? And then at that point, you know, you're. I guess that's comparable to a career S, which is kind of also similar on power, but like you're getting, you're getting an engine that has some, that has like at least kind of equivalent character in that. It's kind of a big rumbly V8. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, and the other thing too, is I don't think anybody cares about the fuel economy play at this pr- price point And this, you know, even with 375 horsepower, it's still going to probably, you know, drink a fair amount of gas you know it's not like you're gonna like get this like amazing 39 miles per gallon roadster that you can daily drive or something mm-hmm. but yeah it'd be interesting i will be honestly this is one that will be you know intriguing to drive because we can legitimately look at this very expensive undoubtedly well done mercedes and say hmm, is this you know legitimately not worth it you know we don't get to say that very often about super high-end cars just because value is relative and they all come with sumptuous furnishings often. And it could end up being that I end up driving it and really like it because I, at the same time as I'm saying all this about like, well, you could just get the V8. Honestly, the uh, four-cylinder, like the EcoBoost Mustang, the high-performance one that they offered, it's one of my favorite Mustangs, and a big part of that is because it's got so much less weight on the front end that it feels much more nimble and fun and better balanced. So, who knows? I might end up driving it and being like, you know what? This is actually the sneaky best version of the SL. Yeah. So, so we'll see. On paper, it feels like a hard sell. <laughs> I honestly feel like knowing you a little bit here, I feel like you would be the one who would be like, guys, actually, this car isn't bad. You kind of come in out of left field and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It does this. It drives pretty well. Here it is. So um, we'll see. We'll Mm -hmm. see. All right. There's a new 5 Series. That's actually a pretty big deal in our world. It looks the same as the electric version known as the i5. Uh, which in and of itself is rather newsworthy. BMW is, they're going down the path with our EVs are just powertrains and more than anything else, they're BMWs, which fair. Okay, that's one way to do it. It's a little bit different than the Mercedes spaceships you can get in the EQ lineups and things like that. Um, But, you know, I've actually always really liked the 5 Series, to be quite honest. It's... uh, sort of like the right size sedan, I guess. In my book, I always like the balance of, you know, it's a good size car, but it also handles pretty well. Historically, it's obviously very significant. Uh, What's your initial impressions here? Well, I think probably the first thing that is maybe the most surprising is that the twin kidney grill up front is quite modest uh, based on modern BMW standards. (laughs) That's fair. Yeah. It's, it's a modest traditional grill. That's a very good point. Yeah. And, you know, if you look inside, it's a very, you know, like it's just an evolution of the very, you know, BMW interior, uh, fair amount of variety under the hood, uh, such as it is. So I think that's good. Um, it's a competitive segment now too, you know, and it, it, it definitely is one of the more distinctive five series, you know, it, it doesn't look exactly like the 7, the i7, the 7, or the 3, you know. So, I think they definitely have done, you know, done the work there. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, I believe, uh, one of our contributors, Ronan Glan, has seen the prototype. Um, so, you know, I, this is one that I think as the year goes on. Uh, I think, to me, trying the electric one, the all-electric one, the i5, is where... I'm curious if that will change my opinion of the of the five series itself. Yeah, I've never I've never been like a big five series booster. I mean, I think it's okay. a very competent luxury sedan. Uh, I think this new one will be interesting. I like some of the interior touches. It's got the cool yeah. backlit kind of geometric glass crystal trim that we've seen in like the new seven series that's really neat 
And I mean, I do appreciate that some of the exterior is toned down just a little bit, but it's still it's still quite distinct. It's very oh, what's the word? It's it's very much kind of folded and creased and a little bit more straight edged than past five series models. So, I mean, I've never been super into the five series. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this will be good. Uh, I, I guess I don't know that I'm like super excited for it. Um, but I will be, I will be intrigued to drive the electric one because a lot of BMW's electric offerings so far have actually been pretty good. The iX is one is uh, been one of my more favorite modern BMWs because I feel like they're starting to bring back a little bit of the old kind of BMW driving character for a long for boy years now. They've been almost like numbers over experience, like kind of very dead numb steering and kind of effective but not very enjoyable suspension but i feel like that's starting to change a little bit so so i'll be interested to try it out all right uh speaking of electrics the escalade is going electric we kind of expected this they're going to use the iq uh naming structure which falls in roughly with like the lyric that type of thing and the celestic it sounds like the escalade is going to be more like the escalade iq not the elastic Elastic? I don't think that sounds right. The Escaladic? I don't know. Escalade, well, but with a Q instead of a C in the beginning. Yeah, oh, there you go. I didn't think of that one. But, um, you know, I, I, this is going to be significant for General Motors. We don't know really anything else about this, but they put out the name in a teaser that shows nothing. It's basically the name itself. Um, Escalade IQ? I don't know if that's right. I guess the what it does is it starts the conversation. That what is that? It's the electric Escalade, which maybe maybe is better than calling it the electric Escalade, like Genesis does with the uh, you know the GV70, the electrified Genesis GV70. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it's really any better or worse than anything else that they could really come up with. And the thing is, you can't kill the Escalade name. There is way yep. too much value and way too yep. much. Uh, powerful imagery in that name like that is that is the cadillac um yep. even more than like anything like el dorado was a long time ago like escalate is yeah. that that is the cadillac nameplate that you don't mess with mm -hmm. Agreed. and i'm guessing i'm guessing it's probably going to basically have the powertrains from like gmc hummer ev chevy silverado yeah. ev it's pretty much going to be that, but packaged in a big boxy SUV. Once you, once they've really, I'd say, you know, perfected the Ultium, you know, componentry, you know, the world is their oyster. You know, you could, I assume we'll see a electric Yukon, an electric Tahoe, which I think could be really intriguing. It's just literally plug and play, uh, pardon the cliche. So, uh, you know, frankly, an electric Escalade, that could even overshadow the Hummer, you know, when you start to think about like true name brand recognition. I mean, it's, there's no like negative, like connotation with the Escalade other than it's expensive, you know, where I think some people debated like, well, the Hummer, the Hummer's electric. Did you really want to go down that road? I, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are like an electric, so electric Hummer. Sign me up. Yeah. And I mean, in some ways, it's almost a, it's almost surprising that it's taken this long for yeah the Escalade electric to be even announced. Yep, because it is such a key product for Cadillac, mm -hmm. and especially since we're seeing other full size truck ve platform vehicles coming out of GM, that it seems like just a natural thing. And also, since it feels like GM and a lot of automakers are kind of prioritizing uh, expensive, high-profit, low-volume vehicles over 
like more entry level stuff and Escalade fits that bill very well. But I am I'm excited to see it in part because I think there's a real opportunity to make it an even more distinct vehicle than it is now. Seeing how much variation there is on the like GM electric full size truck platform between Silverado, Sierra, and Hummer, all three of those look significantly different from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm excited to see what Cadillac has planned, especially because the Lyric and the Celestic are really good looking, really striking vehicles. And so I'm excited to see what they can pull off with kind of their biggest, most bold. Well, I say biggest. Celestic might be bigger because <laughs> that thing is huge. It's a battleship of a sedan, such yeah. as it is. But yeah, I'm, ex- I'm excited to see what they can do with it. All right. So let's uh, shift gears here. We've got the wide ranging news section. We'll start to run through a few of these. Honda's back in F1. It's Wednesday afternoon. This news broke uh, Tuesday night, actually, uh, around 1030 uh, in the evening. And I mean, they're going to come back as a supplier. This is uh, it's very significant, I think, in the fact that you are seeing automakers get back into Formula One. You know, Ford's going to be an engine supplier uh, with Red Bull. General Motors is trying to get on the grid uh, with the Cadillac brand. Uh, You've got Alfa Romeo on there. And Just, you know, for a while in the mid, like, tens, if you will, it seemed like automakers kind of moved away from Formula One, perhaps questioning what really is the bang for your buck here. You know, Toyota certainly made that calculation. And now it's like people are, like, rushing to get back in, which I think is, uh, we'll see how that affects, you know, affects things. You know, there are going to be rule changes in 2026 uh, obviously affecting the powertrains, which is when Honda is going to, you know, get on there. Um, I generally think this is good for the F1 fan. You know, I think having more like car companies that, you know, everyday people recognize is good. You know, even if it is like as more or less an engine supplier. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's funny because Honda's barely been gone. They, were yeah. around two years ago, their final right. year was the year that Max Verstappen won the championship yep. with the red with a Red Bull Honda, mm-hmm. and so it's it's interesting that Honda was like pretty set on leaving, and now they're coming back after having only been gone just a little bit. I don't know. It's it, it's kind of weird. I'm not I'm not entirely sure what the uh, what prompted them to come back? I don't know. Maybe I, maybe Aston Martin gave them an offer that they couldn't refuse. It's a it's a good deal for Aston Martin. You know, Honda knows how to make pretty good F one engines. So, and I, I'm not sure Aston Martin um, necessarily has the long term cash to you know keep spending F one money. So I think it's a good deal for all parties, really. Mm-hmm. And coming in in a year when everybody is going to have new engines means that it's a more even playing field than if you're going up against companies that have been doing it for a while and have things really dialed in. Fernando Alonso was not cool with Honda, you know, almost eight, nine, 10 years ago. Uh, But that was one of the things they, they even said is like, Hey, if he's still racing, we're cool. Apparently time heals all wounds. So, um, I hope Fernando Alonso is still racing in 2026. That's, I mean, he's going to be well into his 40s at that point. But um, my guess is he won't still be around. But apparently, their both sides are good with it. Well, and honestly, at that point when he was being critical of Honda's engines, he was kind of right. Yeah, they weren't great. <laughs> right, like he wasn't wrong. Yeah, I'm se- semi-related. I really wish that F1 would go ahead and greenlight Andretti and GM to enter F1. Mm-hmm. It's it's still just ridiculous to me that they would question at all the viability of that kind of entry. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think 
having an American team on the grid is only good for everyone, you know, for the fans, for the series, for General Motors, for Cadillac, for Andretti, like, you know, you do this, you're going to get not just like the physical, like presence of a new American team, you're getting all the money that General Motors spends on advertising. Like, you don't think they're going to promote the hell out of this, that they're back in F1. That's essentially, if you're F1, it's like you're essentially getting free GM advertising. So, yeah, I agree, I agree with you. I kind of keep waiting for something to drop on that, and nothing does. And it's like Andretti is one of the premier racing groups in America, yeah. say nothing of the world. And they know open wheel racing from IndyCar. And you can kind of say the same about GM. They've been building open wheel race car engines for decades and they have the engineering might of general motors it's it should be a (laughs) no-brainer should be uh but you know the other thing about f1 is politics they love politics in formula one so um i imagine something that perhaps maybe is a little strange is holding things up you never know but All right, we had some cool spy shots this week and a couple of Corvettes being tested. Uh, Associate editor Byron Hurd really kind of looks into his crystal ball and offers up a number of different scenarios of what could be going on. You know, the wheels look kind of weird. It's heavily camouflaged. So you got to check this out. Nobody really wants to hear me describe the the spy shots on the podcast. Uh, But, you know, you're kind of wondering what this could be, you know? Uh, some wonder Byron brings up the specter of this could be the Zora. Um, what do you think in your crystal ball? Yeah, I haven't looked super close cause these did come in recently and I only just got back into the work groove of things after my trip pretty much last night. Um, I mean, the logical progression would be for a ZR1 of some sort, something that goes above and beyond even the already impressive Z06. I I don't know if that means maybe making it the Z06 all-wheel drive. I would imagine probably adding forced induction of some sort, whether it's turbocharging or supercharging the regular v8 or doing the same or doing that to the flat plane crank double overhead cam engine from the z06 well it's probably not the four cylinder speaking of things like the sl43 so um i don't know get in the get in the comments let us know what you think i mean this is there's a lot going on here uh corvette's a really cool story right now just with all the different things they're doing i think we've seen more innovation in Corvette in the last, um, you know, few, like, couple years than we did in arguably the previous, you know, 50. You know, you go mid-engine, you go electric, you go hybrid, all-wheel drive, a lot to unpack there. So, I hope Corvette spy shots, to me, are always, like, just it's one of the fun part of, parts of this job, you know. So, uh, all right. Uh, let's talk, last thing, rumors here, the Hyundai Envision 74. Uh, I wrote a column a couple of weeks ago saying, hell yes, please build this. Um, there were rumors that the concept was going to go to production. Then there were some rumors that there weren't. It seems like there's just a lot of competing rumors. For what it's worth, when I wrote my piece, I tried to be very careful and be like, this isn't official, despite what some people say, but they should do it. It may not happen, but it should. And you know, then there was a report saying, "Hey, no, it's not going to happen." Then there's another report saying, "No, wait, 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 it might happen." So, yeah, I think I just go back to my original position. They should do this. You know, forget the hydrogen stuff. Make it electric. Probably hybrid might be okay if that's what it takes to get this design out. But Hyundai has more than enough electric componentry. Grab the powertrain from the Ionic Five at six. Drop it in this thing, use that design, let's party. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be really cool if it went came into production. And uh, as an electric, I think it would make the most sense. Especially, especially as like a way to 
as a way to kind of have a halo for Hyundai's current electric platform, the Ionic 5N will definitely go some way to that, but to have... I mean, I also generally would like to see semi-affordable electric sports cars, and I could see the potential here. I, uh... It's... It's such an out there car though and it sounds like it is pretty much built on like a borderline race car chassis i guess part of me kind of wonders how production feasible it is maybe is like a track only toy which i'd be a little bit disappointed in i mean it would be neat but like yeah I'd like to see something that actually you know you could drive on the street I don't think they, for what it's worth, I don't think they should do like a Lamborghini, Ferrari, track only toy. I I don't think they should do that. I think they should take the design and make it something that's, you know, I I argued more like a Genesis coupe, you know. Um, So we'll see. Maybe what I'm even advocating for isn't even possible. You know, maybe just based on this concept, it is more like a you know, expensive track only toy. Uh, I believe it's related genetically to the Genesis X, which is quite large. So, you know, we'll see, but we're also hearing rumors that that thing could be, you know, heading to production. So, um, Hyundai's willing to throw some money around in the coupe segment. I, I think they should throw some here. Yeah. And the Genesis X, I believe that has been confirmed that something is coming from that. Officially official. Okay. And that I that I think makes a lot of sense for them, and I think is probably an easier sell because like you could probably keep the volume very low on that and charge a whole lot of money and you know more or less break even. It's always trickier with something that would be potentially more affordable, like mm-hmm. kind of the hypothetical electric production in Vision seventy four that we're talking about. I I would agree with you that, like, something akin to the Genesis Coupe from years ago would be kind of the sweet thing. Mm -hmm. Sort of like an electric sort of Mustang fighter of sorts. I think that would be super, super, super cool. And, And the thing is, Hyundai Motor Group has shown time and time again they are willing to put something into the into production that might not be super successful just to kind of give it a try and see what happens. Yeah. We've seen that with Stinger, we've seen that with Veloster, we're probably going to see that with Genesis X. And that's something that I do admire that they're willing to give give things a shot even if it doesn't necessarily work out. Um and I think I think that has overall paid off for them because I do think even if some of those models haven't sold amazingly well, I think they have been great image boosters, Stinger especially. And some of that may have something to do with how bold the company has been in other things. Like just the styling of the Ionic cars is so bold and exciting and different and something that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see from like a car company rivaling Toyota, Volkswagen, and GM. And I think Hyundai is the better for it. Like they've, because they've been willing to take chances on some like really bold things, they've got stuff that looks and feels like nothing else and performs amazingly and is letting them kind of become that company that can rival the the big ones. Yeah. No, well said. Well said. I think um, they've taken some risks and, you know, I I think this would be another good spot for them to take another risk. So uh, let's talk about what we've been driving. Um, Speaking of Hyundai Motor Co, I've been in the, the, uh, the Kia Telluride. This is the SX Prestige X Pro with the V6. Um, So, you know, it's, it's pretty nice. It's dressed up kind of like an off-roader, if you will. Uh, people love the paint. Multiple people came up to me and asked me what color it was. 
And one time I actually just picked up the window sticker and said, oh, it's a midnight lake blue paint for a $95 option. They're like, wow, aren't you lucky? You got a new car. It's so hard to buy a car. And I just left it there because it's, you know, trying to explain what in the world this press car was. That's a lot. Um, I like the uh, the X Pro feature. I think it kind of, the tires, it's got those kind of beefy knobby tires. This one has 18-inch uh, black alloy wheels. It's got the X Pro exterior styling, which isn't really much. And it does have a self-leveling rear suspension, which is kind of cool. Kind of like that. Um, so that's basically what it is, if you will. Uh, it's, you know, it's got the, the V6, which is 3.8 liters. And generally, it's, uh, you know, pretty enjoyable, large crossover. I like the Telluride. Uh, this one is 55. So some of the, like, the really, like, we always looked at the Telluride as a supreme value. This one, you get into 55. You still get a lot of stuff. I don't really know what most Telluride owners, they really want that off-roady look, but maybe they do. I don't know. I, I probably, as much as I liked it, if it were my hard-earned cash, I don't know if I'd go quite this way because 55 grand for a Kia Telluride, still a good value, but it had some stuff I don't know if I necessarily would need. Interior was beautiful, brown seats, uh, kind of like that like Hyundai Kia, like wood trim stuff they use. Uh, really enjoyed it. Put a ton of stuff in it, logged a ton of miles on it. Uh, it gets 21 miles per gallon combined. So not great. You know, you do kind of, you know, run through the fuel. Uh, highly functional baseball gear, golf gear, uh, a ton of like various like, you know, eating adventures as you do um, that type of thing. I don't think the dog went in it, but all the things you would do in a Telluride, it for what it's worth, it just reaffirmed my uh, general positive vibes of the Telluride. You know, again, this trim level, kind of expensive compared to some of the other ones you could get in the Telluride, but it was V6 and all-wheel drive. So really any large-ish crossover, once you do that, you're going to start paying. So um, okay value. Um, yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Have you driven a Telluride lately? Not for a while. Um... Yeah. And I believe the tagline is actually, have you driven a Ford lately? Um, Technically, <laughs> yes. Throwing back to those old commercials. It is. Um, no, it, it's, it's been a little while. But, I mean, everything that I remember from driving Tiger Ride or even Palisade is just that they're extremely good SUVs. <laughs> there's, not, there's not really much of a weak point to any of them except maybe kind of that fuel mileage that you mentioned cool so speaking of you know things you have driven more recently you drove uh slingshot which i have never driven one of those so how was it what did you think you drove it in hawaii no less so that's kind of cool yeah so i had never driven one either and figured hey you know what i'm Gonna have a little bit of time in Hawaii. Beautiful weather, beautiful sights. I'll get something open, and why not try a slingshot? Well, boy, do I have reasons why not at this point. And the, sl the slingshot is a very unique experience for a variety of reasons. Many of them not great. Okay, I'll. Yeah. Where to start? I guess maybe I guess maybe the first thing to say is you can definitely tell that the majority of the vehicles the Polaris designs, engineers and builds are side-by-sides and ATVs. And that is clear everywhere. Immediately when you get into it, the whole thing feels like kind of a plastic tub and very sort of all weather plastic tub kind of thing. It it's definitely definitely weatherproof, and that's that's important because there is no roof and there's no windows. But it definitely feels kinda low rent. Uh especially especially when like these 
you should also keep in mind that these cars start in the high $20,000 range, and that's where they start. And that's, that's Mazda Miata money. And when you keep, the, when you bear that in mind, you're realizing that you don't get a roof, you don't get a top, you don't get heat, you don't get air conditioning, uh, you can't get any kind of like power seat adjustment or anything like that, or heating or, or seat heaters or coolers. Um, as far as I could tell, it doesn't have any radio reception either. It's just Bluetooth. This one did have this one did have navigation, which is kind of impressive. Uh, but you're going with very little features for the money. And let's see. The refinement is also characteristic of kind of side by sides. Everything is loud. Uh when you get ready to start it up, the fuel pump is really loud. Uh, when the engine starts, the engine is really loud. And it's not just... The engine does actually have some good points to it. Uh, it's actually got not a bad exhaust note. Um, when you're really getting on it, the intake has kind of a good sort of deep honk, almost akin to kind of like some Hondas. Uh, it actually makes good power, too. It makes around 200 horsepower. And it, and it will technically rev up to like 8,000 RPM. Uh, but you're also getting lots and lots of just general drivetrain and engine noise, just kind of the, kind of the metal sliding and clattering and all that kind of noise. You're also getting kind of whines and groans from like the belt drive that goes to the rear wheel, uh, because the slingshot is rear wheel drive, which is interesting. Um, it's a layout that would seem great. The downside, though, is that when you have just one tire, you have effectively halved the amount of rear-wheel traction that you have in comparison with, like, a four-wheeled vehicle. <laughs> and it's that much worse when you're going around a corner because you've got this little bitty tire that's... It, it's, not like a, it's not like a conventional car where you've got a differential that can uh, change the speeds at each end, which is necessary. Uh, so you basically have like this really narrow locked rear axle. And so when you're going around a corner, it's actually very easy to get the back end to break out, either to do a burnout or to slide it. And surprisingly, the traction control will let you do a fair bit of that before it kicks in. Uh, depending on your perspective, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it could certainly be entertaining. Uh... Ride and handling actually not that bad. Um, okay. It doesn't have a whole lot of travel, but like it absorbed things all right. Very little ground clearance, which was a bit of a negative in some areas around Hawaii. Um, as I mentioned, the engine does actually have good power and can sound pretty good. If you get one, I beg of you, get a manual transmission one, not the automated manual, not the automatic. Because the automatic is literally an automated manual. It is doing the clutching and shifting automatically for you. And it's sort of like if you were driving a car and you had to tell somebody, hey, I want you to shift now. And they have to kind of guess the, cl guess the shift timing and the clutch engagement and disengagement without necessarily having a direct feeling of like what your throttle is and what, what exactly you're wanting. It works better than you might think, but the shifts are really slow and especially like leaving from a stop or backing up. There's lots and lots of slip and it's not necessarily all that uh, quick at doing it. So strongly, strongly recommend getting a manual transmission one. If you do decide that you do want one. Um, and the lack of a top means that if, if you're caught out in the rain, which I was frequently, it's pretty miserable to drive it in the rain. <laughs> um, and a, a lot, a lot of my time with it, it was feeling kind of like a classic top gear segment where like this vehicle is causing me lots and lots of misery. And 
it was also kind of like a classic Top Gear bit because when I finally got to uh, Volcanoes National Park and I drove this road called Chain of Craters, and it is one of the most gorgeous roads I have ever driven on. Not necessarily like one that you would go hit up if you want to like drive fast, but just the views are incredible. Like you get to see rainforesty, jungly kind of stuff. You get to see old lava flows. You get an incredible view all off the volcano and down to the coast. And in that moment, in those gorgeous places, not having a roof or a windshield or even like just pillars, not having anything that could obstruct my view was pretty amazing. And it was kind of the perfect car for that moment. Was it worth it for the entire trip? It's close. (laughs) I'm not quite sure I can go all that way. But in that moment, I was like, you know, I'm kind of glad that I've got this. Um, so there are moments, there were moments where it kind of finally came together. And I think Polaris has something with this. I mean, the fact that they sell a lot of them and the people that buy them they absolutely adore them. Uh, but I think there are things that they could do to make it a lot better. And something I was thinking, if they could make an electric version, I think that could fix a lot of the issues that I have, kind of like the responsiveness with it being an automatic, uh, a lot of the a lot of the powertrain noise that just kind of dominates the experience when you kind of just want to enjoy the openness. <laughs> um, I I kind of think an electric version could really be something special. But yeah, so it was it was an experience. Oh, and if you ever wanted to. F- if you ever wanted to feel like you were driving a supercar, the slingshot kind of does it because so many times I was stopped at a restaurant or at a gas station or in traffic. People were asking me about it and saying like, man, that thing is so cool. That must be the most fun thing in the world. So you get a little bit of a supercar experience too. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. I would say just kind of listening to you, it sounds like it was worth it. Uh, it sounds like there were a lot of trade-offs and kind of craziness, but um, it sounds to me like it was worth it. I think in the end, yeah. I still don't think I would. Re- I don't think I would necessarily recommend it for a trip to Hawaii. In part, just because while that moment was really awesome, so much of the rest was really rough. Re- yeah, <laughs> man, driving in the rain is bad. It's really, really bad unless you have like a helmet that will pr- mm-hmm. with like a face shield. Um. Because the visibility mm. and the discomfort were pretty awful trying to drive it in the rain. And it rained and it rained a lot while I was there. It does that in Hawaii. It yeah. does that from time so, to time. So I think I would actually probably recommend like a Jeep Wrangler mm-hmm. driving around Hawaii. Yeah. Especially because you pull the doors off of that thing and you get pretty close to the same kind of open air experience. In fact, you might even get a little bit more airflow. I think the way the slingshot is designed, where it's got a really large rear cowl behind you, I think in some ways might impede some of the airflow. (laughs) Um, Because honestly, I kind of feel like I got almost as much airflow like in my Miata when I was driving that with the top Mm. down. Okay. Um, So I think I would probably actually recommend like a Wrangler (laughs) for that kind of thing. And just kind of open it up as much as you can for those special moments. And then most of the rest of the time, just like flip the top back and keep the windows down. So that when you get caught in that inevitable rain shower, you still have a windshield and can flip the top back up. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. So that brings us somewhat to our spend my money question. Uh, Basically, the, the writer, and we grabbed this from our cars on Reddit. So if you're a Reddit user... Um, you know, hey, feel free to respond. Uh, feel free to send us some feedback. You know, we hope we hope there are some Reddit and Autoblog users that uh, you know, you know, are there all at once. So the writer says, almost forty, looking for a midlife crisis car that's flashy but also off-road capable. Uh, I have a work truck that's fully loaded with tools, but that's my only vehicle. 
I just had my second kid two weeks ago, so I need something that's decent for two kids. Tricky part is I would on occasion like to use it for work when I don't need so many tools in a day. And I often drive unpaved uh, roads. So uh, let's see. I think Subarus are most suited for me, but I love Golf GTIs and Stingers. Uh, budget is 40 to 50 grand Canadian, which basically translates to uh, roughly 29,000 to 30,000 US. So uh, one of the things bantied about, if you will, is um, was a used Bronco, which at this point, there are some like used Broncos out there. I see one on Carfax, actually. You could get a 2021 Ford Bronco Black Diamond for like 47 grand. So that's, that's doable. Uh, there's a 2021 Ford Bronco Wild Track. Uh, these are US dollars, so it's going to be a little bit over your budget, I would say, given the exchange rate here. Uh, or my other option would be go really old, find like a 90s squared off Bronco, and you might even come in under budget. Um, it's fun. It sounds like, you know, there's the work truck with the tools and all the stuff that can be a daily driver. But for me, you know, you're thinking midlife crisis, maybe go a little bit sort of kind of vintage. Um, would you recommend a slingshot for the writer or would you go in a different direction? Probably not, given that one of the um, elements was off-roading. But midlife crisis, what do you think? Yeah, off-roading definitely rules out the slingshot. Yeah. yeah. Boy, something that, something that I was thinking in the back of my head, I haven't thought it very far through, so this could be a horrible idea. But part of me was kind of wondering, with Polaris' um, experience with like off-road side-by-sides and things, I was, I, I was thinking to myself, could they do like an off-roady three-wheeler thing like the slingshot? Mm -hmm. I, it, maybe it's a horrible, horrible idea. I know that, I know that three-wheelers with one wheel up front in an off-road configuration are quite bad. Um, I remember that the, uh, the off-road trikes from like what the seventies and eighties from like Honda and other makers were kind of dangerous, <laughs> but thinking about what might be good for him, I kind of think like a Maverick tremor okay. or yeah. maybe even Bronco sport badlands. And okay. I bring that up because he does say that he would, he likes kind of sporty vehicles like GTI stinger, things like that. Both of those get the pretty punchy turbo four cylinder mm -hmm. that Ford puts in those. And the Badlands in particular, even though it has the uh, the twin clutch rear differential, mainly for off-road stuff, I can speak from experience, it makes it quite fun in town. Uh, it does a good job like doing torque vectoring stuff and it. Like these things can corner pretty impressively. Um, I think I would lean toward the Maverick because I think the Maverick is a little cooler than the Bronco, but you know, your mileage varies with styling. It's eye of the beholder and whatnot. Uh, so I think I'd kind of be leaning toward those or possibly Santa Cruz turbo. Cause that thing is another excellent handling little truck. And it's got like a little bit of ground clearance and stuff. So you could, do kind of light driving and things back seats, maybe a little tight. Um, but if the kids are small for now, yeah, it might work. <laughs> yeah. Now I, another one I would bring up too, as I think about this, and I think this fits a little bit of the daily driver, a little bit of the midlife crisis is like a mid teens Tacoma, you know, kind of end the segment here and the show here, bring things back to the taco, get like a TRD TRD pro. It's kind of fun, but you can still daily drive it. Obviously. And still put the kids in it too. So, uh, and just random thought a three wheel off road thing like you're suggesting sounds terrifyingly awesome. I don't know. <laughs> it sounds terrifying. It, just the lack of stability like that would be crazy. I mean, it would be literally like, I feel like you either want to go two or four, you know, yeah. you either want like a buggy type thing or you want, you know, like just a dirt bike or something, you know, mm -hmm. but. All right. So send us your spend my money. So that's podcast at autoblog.com. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating on 
Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you might get the show. Be safe out there. Have a great holiday weekend, and we'll see you next week.